So I have not prepared many, many slides for this. I don't even know how to type in a terminal anymore or get various things to show up here. But uh, this is intended to be a very general purpose Q&A. So if you have any questions about the WASM, eco WASM ecosystem, WASM related, Rust related, WASM time related, or other, or other things, JavaScript related, I'll be very frank, there are many aspects that I do not understand and I'll be very, I will let you know if, if, if we happen to go on one of those topics. And if no one has questions, I have prepared my questions for you. I have some quizzes of uh, various features about WASM. So this is if we don't have many questions, but I have little trivia effects, which I can ask you all and see how, how big the WASM language is, for example. But in any case, uh, there's some microphones in the back and I figure if anyone has a question, feel free to just raise your hand and we can just kind of see where this goes. So does anyone have a question? All right, I get to bore you all with WASM facts then at this point. I'm gonna run a little, ex little exercise. The question here is how many opcodes does WASM have? This is specifically measured by WASM partial this morning. I took a look at both stable and unstable proposals. I want everyone to participate. So we're gonna just do a raise of hands here. So the goal is to think of a number in your head and you wanna be the closest without going over. So you can't have too many. Don't, don't, don't guess 10,000. Sorry, I'm giving it away already. So uh, if you think that, uh, so everyone think of kind of how many opcodes are in WASM and everyone put your hand up. Everyone who wants to participate. All right. So if you think there are more than a thousand opcodes, put your hand down because you're wrong. If you think there's more than 700 opcodes, put your hand down. If you think there's fewer than 400 opcodes, put your hand down. Oh wow, that got a lot. Okay, if you think there are, you don't count till I told, I told you this morning. If you think there are fewer than 500, put your can down. All right, we have like, how many, how many? I was just thinking 500. 500? 500. 500? Uh, we're close, but the answer for, as of Wasm Parts this morning was 618. Now the next question, how many of those are SIMD? <laughs> 618 total opcodes. If you think it's 400 or higher, put your hand down. If you think it's 300 or higher, put your hand down. If you think it's 200 or fewer, put your hand down. All right, what do we got? Oh, you don't count anymore. What do we got? All right. 250? Anyone else? 256. Precisely 256 opcodes for Cindy. All right. That's my, that's my boring trivia fact for now. So has that stirred the creative juices? Any questions for ecosystem things or various aspects? <laughs> well, we'll come to that later. What's up? That's okay, I, I, I can repeat it. Debugging process, because uh, yeah, there was a group as far as I remember, but uh, as far as I see in GitHub, the last activity was in 2019 or something like that. So, is there some group that we can join and can help with the debugging process right now? Yeah, definitely. This is uh, debug info and debugging WASM is a broad topic and has lots of various aspects in many places that have been uh, people have tried to tackle this. So. Um, the main one is Dwarf. So this is a lot of LLVM-based languages, C and C++ and Rust and things like that. There is support in LLVM to emit Dwarf, and there is sort of basic support in some browsers. I think, I think Chrome, for example, does this. I think Firefox might do this. And Wasm Times does, has basic support for like printing file names and line numbers and backtraces and things like that. So going beyond that, going towards like a sort of setting breakpoints, setting uh, like kind of watch conditions, taking a look at variables on the stack, that's all possible-ish in the sense of like LDB and WASM time locally, but like that's not necessarily fully integrated. And so the answer is like, I don't, it hasn't really progressed a whole lot beyond that point. There's been some questions of sort of, we don't necessarily, I, folks have generally not wanted to just take Dwarf as is and say like, all right, this is our solution. We're just gonna put Dwarf in the web and say that's how everything works at this point. That's kind of where Dwarf works really good for like Rust and C and C++ because that's what they could do on native but it doesn't work well for other languages like Python or JavaScript or C-sharp or JavaScript compiled to WASM for out of browser use cases. So that's where it kind of gives rise to the idea of more of like a debug adapter, debug style protocol, where the idea is that you as a language provide the idea of like, I can debug my modules and you can have whatever custom sections you want. For Rust, that would be Dwarf. For JavaScript, it might be totally different, like a source map or something. 
Um, and then the idea is that that is the protocol, that is the standardization. But as, you've, as you have seen, not a whole lot, I, at least I'm not personally aware of many activities that have happened in that area. So as far as I know, it's still right for contribution, it's still right for folks who are interested to, to come in, but there's definitely a lot of ground to, to, to make up there. I didn't repeat the question, it was about debug info, sorry. Anyway, yes. Um, to, to add to what Alex was saying, um, there are um, a bunch of activities for individual languages. Um, I, I heard earlier today that there's a pull request open for .NET for um, debugging support, um, which is self-hosted in, in a component. Um, so in this case, it's component-based, not module-based. Um, I'm actually working on the same for JavaScript, and um, there is in the, um, so not on the standard side, but in the bike lines, there's an RFC open for um, a way to add debugging support for components across different languages in kind of a debugging, uh, debug adapter style um, with kind of a bring your own debugger um, as a separate component that gets a few additional powers um, approach. And um, right now, I think the interesting parts are to add that to more languages, find a little bit more about what does work, what doesn't, um, and then eventually we can tackle more complex stuff ways around how do we um, debug across languages? How do you step from a Rust code base into a Python code base with a step through debugger in a seamless way? Um, and that will require standardization. We are not quite there yet. Um, very happy to um, talk more, probably not on a microphone, about um, what could happen in detail to help out with these things. Yeah, just to add, because right now, uh, ChatBrains, uh, we are members of TC39, and uh, me also helping to on the source map standard. And right now I feel that there are two big groups, one that only for source maps and other one that only for Dwarf. And uh, yeah, and it's a little bit hard. It, I mean, it's hard for <laughs> languages to support both of them. I mean, right now, thankfully, source maps is not quite big standard, so you can uh, like compile Dwarf to source maps. But uh, right now, the standard is um, evaluate, evaluating, evolu uh, has evolution, <laughs> yep, uh, so, yep, and more proposals uh, there, and both supporting also WASM, and yep, just to know what standard uh, will be the, the thing for WASM. I can only say from my perspective, I, I do think there's a bit of the risk of the whole XKCD, there's like four standards, we're making a fifth standard, we're gonna try and solve all the standard problems. And so I, I think from my personal perspective, what I would say is I do think there's a lot of space to explore here, and I don't think there's a clear answer of what, about what the best object is. Like maybe this hypothetical fifth standard is the best thing, and it'll replace source maps, or replace dwarf, and everyone will be super happy. Or maybe it will just be that runtimes have to natively support both source maps and dwarf, and it turns out that your language just supports one or the other. So I think it'll be interesting to kind of see where it all goes. But all right, I got two questions here, one question here, so we'll just go in order. So I'm gonna, I think I saw you first, and we'll go up here and here. Thank you. I have a high level question. So what's the state of the ecosystem for Wasm on embedded devices? And like, what's the value pitch there? Presumably they're not running on like an interpreter, like Whammer or something like that. So what value does it, does Wasm have here? That's a very good question, and this is definitely one of those topics that I'm not the expert in. So I'll, I'll answer a little bit, but I think there's actually a talk about embedded stuff later today. Would highly recommend you go to that. I suspect they'll probably go into this much more de in depth. Um, some of the benefits that I have heard are that, for example, it's much more easy to deploy these changes. So uh, you can have your WASM interpreter on a device already, and you don't, uh, deployments kind of updating that code, getting something new out there is much easier if you just download WASM as opposed to having to like reflash the device or kind of redo the entire device. So it's kind of a little bit easier for deployment strategy. Something I've also heard is in terms of uh, a lot of these devices, they have an official tool chain, and that's sort of the device manufacturer gives you a tool chain, but it typically is like GCC4 from like 1995 or something like that. So it's super old. But uh, so what WASM is able to do is you can compile your WASM runtime with the super old tool chain, and then you get to use Clang 19 or whatever the current Clang is, so you get much nicer tool chain support in that regard. So that's what I'm aware of. 
But again, I'm not the expert in this area. I think there are probably folks in this room who are probably better experts than I am, but I think the talk uh, later today will probably go into a lot more as well. I know they're gonna talk more about like uh, kind of shrinking it, shrinking a wasm runtime as small as possible to get it running on a device. All right, anybody question over here? Hi there, just to get your opinion on, going back to your previous question about how many opcodes, do you personally feel a multiple choice here, that it's A, we've got room for some expansion, B, maybe manageable at the moment, or C, too many, we don't really want to create too many more at this time? Well, you asked that question to five people, you're gonna get five different answers. So I'm gonna give my answer. Again, personal opinions, personal, <laughs> personal opinions, like take it as a grain of salt. I think there's room to expand. I think that uh, the WASM CPU as sort of a, a paradigm as a concept is an abstraction over native CPUs. And it's not going to be able to uh, succeed and go the like, full, full distance that you might expect a virtual ISA if we just lock it down at what it is today and say it goes no further. So for example, we don't have AES, we don't have CRC, we don't have 256-bit SIMD, we don't have even wider SIMD, we don't have all sorts of things like, uh, like division, 120-bit integers. There's, like, the list goes on and on of, they're not necessarily general purpose operations, but sort of niche operations. Like if you want your code to be fast, we have these CPUs with thousands of instructions and we kind of need it there to sort of do all that. Because this is also intention in the sense of, uh, you could imagine that you could have a sufficiently smart compiler that kind of pattern matches your function, but with so many WASM runtimes, we can't necessarily assume that because there's many, many, many WASM compilers. You can't necessarily have that sort of, uh, sort of optimizations there and, and all that. Now, obviously there is the other end of this, which is that there are so many opcodes and if you want to write a new WASM interpreter, how do, you, how do you get started? How do you actually like implement the entire world all at once, all of SIMD all at once? And this is where I do also think there's a lot of value in having defined subsets at some point. So like a standard, standardized, this is the non simd opcode set. This is the non-GC opcode set, things like that. This has been, there's been lots of discussion in the WASM CG itself. Folks have many different, opinion, different opinions on this. And uh, personally though, I, that's something that I would like to see. I would actually like to see sort of a standard definition, not a ad hoc per language definition, per project definition, something like that. And that sort of enables uh, to have it a little bit more useful. This is sort of similar to kind of like RISC-V, where, or risk five, where you have sort of the base instruction set, which is just integers, you can attack everything else on. But the idea is as a compiler, like a LLVM compiler that is generating WASM, you can select specifically, I want to have very, very few instructions, and sort of that's the benefit of that. So in my mind, I think we want to, sh like WASM should be shooting for the benefit of both being able to target small instruction sets for easy to small devices with like, very high critical security requirements, things like that, but also target use cases that have a very broad range of various niches that you might care about, but no one else in the world cares about, or very, very few other people in the world care about, things like that. All right, thank you, right next. We have a microphone on route. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you yeah, for doing all the work uh, and reviewing loads of pull requests. Yeah, so uh, I had a question. There is such a thing like when you run in WASM and allocating some memory, linear memory grows and grows and grows, and yeah, it never goes down. So uh, there are like, I mean, ways to like make it grow down, but I don't know if it's gonna be standardized any like time soon. Do you know how this workflow is going? That's a very good question. And uh, the most, the, the primary one that I'm aware of here is the proposal for memory.discard. I believe it's not technically shrinking memory, it's saying that I actually still have all access to all my memory, but it effectively corresponds to mAdvise don't need on, on Unix, which is saying I'm gonna discard all the pages, all the backing pages, but I'm gonna zero all the, all the contents out. So it's sort of like a really efficient mem zero, but in a sense it's just, it still is actually discarding the memory, and it's, but you still have it mapped into your process. So that's what I'm aware of kind of the current uh, sort of state of the art as proposals. Um, that's still like a relatively early stage proposal, so I don't think it's implemented very, very widely amongst browsers yet, or I don't think it may not, may not even have flags you can turn it on. Um, that's sort of the general idea. Actually shrinking memory is going to be a bit of an interesting thing in the sense that uh, you started with WASM, you can only grow, so now every module created so far in the world has assumed it can only grow, and trying to retroactively say, well, it turns out it can also go the other direction, it makes sense, but it might, it's gonna be a little difficult to kind of keep the exas, existing ecosystem working at the same time. Now, regardless, I do think this is going to happen eventually. This sort of MVP, most viable product for WASM is sort of the initial release to get a, a sort of a broad range of use cases, but it's certainly not 100% of use cases. So I, I think it's guaranteed over the next five, 10 years, we're gonna see something like this. Either memory.discard, memory.shrink, something like that's gonna happen. 
Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I could bore you with more trivia. Oh, we have one back there. Oh, over there. Yeah. Hey, Alex. So I feel like in a lot of these conferences, we come in where you discuss, oh, what's happening in WASIO 2, what's coming up in WASIO 3. So I was curious to hear your thoughts on how do you think WASI 1.0 is going to look like? How far away is that? What are we missing? And yeah, so your thoughts. Okay, these are all excellent questions. Very, very good question. I, again, this is my personal thoughts, my own personal perspective, so take everything with a grain of salt. But uh, in my mind, it's, it's indeterminate. I don't, we don't know when WASI 1.0 is going to come about. It's going to be, it's a function of many, many forces involved, many, many like, strategies, companies, development, um, like priorities, kind of where this all ends up, ends up and where it ends up leading us. One of the problems is that uh, in dealing with WASI, we're sort of, we're trying to create a standard by which these modules can all interoperate with hosts and things like that. But sort of the expectation that everyone wants is that whatever is put out there is perfectly stable, runs everywhere, solves every problem that anyone, anyone ever wants, and will never change. And obviously, that's not going to happen. That's, that's, it's, a, I mean, it's, it's very reasonable as a user to want that, because that's what Unix is. Unix is perfectly stable. It only changes in backwards compatible ways. Windows is like that. That's how all existing operating systems work, the web as well. It's very, very difficult to start from scratch and just create that and then at the same time not make these sorts of mistakes where it's like, oh, well, now we have to carry this around for 15 years, 30 years in the future. So this it basically, that's sort of, a, uh, it's motivating this kind of 0.2, then 0.3, and that's kind of slow march forward as we, we not only are, like, we, it's not like we have this idea of 1.0 in our heads and we're just gonna, we're, we're hiding it from you and like every year we're like, all right, here's a little bit more, here's a little bit more. No, it's, we're discovering all this at the same time. We're trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work. And the, the versioning methodology so far is basically 0.2 to 0.1, or sorry, 0.1 to 0.2 was we want components. That is the major feature. 0.2 to 0.3 is we want everything to keep working in components but wanna add async. And so what's beyond 0.3, it's a little unclear at this point. It kind of depends how well async works, how well languages pick that up, how, how, how suitable it is for languages that aren't currently using WASI, that want to use WASI. And it could be the case that one year from now, O3 is perfectly stable, and we just stamp it saying that's 1.0 and it's good to go. So I think, I think not a great answer to your question. I'm, I'm explaining why it's hard, but in terms of timeline, I have actually no idea. I would suspect maybe in 30 years, WASI 1.0 exists in the next five years. To me, it's a little unclear. I think. We could see it, we could not. It's it's very much depends on sort of how all these design go, how all these design processes go, how the uh, ecosystem integration goes, kind of all that aspect. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your thoughts. Oh, we got one back there. Yeah, hi. Um, so WebAssembly is not web, and WebAssembly is not assembly. But I do wonder, looking at this conference and also BASM IO in Barcelona, um, WebAssembly seems to be converting into a server topic or like in the cloud topic. But I do wonder, um, where is all the browser folk? In the sense of like where are the browser and folk? You're from Fermion, so I don't know <laughs> if you have the right answer here. So maybe more of a question to the room or I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm looking at Ryan, who's a browser folk from Mozilla. <laughs> I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I can at least, we have a hand raised there. So I think. All right, we got one. Any other browser folk in the room? Oh, we got two browser folks, three. Okay, we have some. Yeah, I, I can say that I'm here, but I don't know, is there another question? I would also, I'd also be interested in that, although, I mean, I thought about giving a talk here, but then I had a kid this year, and I said, no, probably not. But maybe next year. Please do. There you go. Yeah, that's maybe not so exciting um, as you may think, but um, so I discovered that we have some business logic in, so in the front end applications like Vue.js and React, and there are other different bits and pieces. And I thought that we 
constantly, repeatedly copied over JavaScript and TypeScript files from one project into another. Um, and one use case we're using, that's basically the only use case for, for now, we are using WebAssembly in the browser, but um, we had a recursive implementation of, an, of a search tool in the browser, if you will. So we get a response from an API that has a nested JSON object, the huge one. And we wanted to give the users the possibility to search through all the values that come from the API, but the, the levels and the nesting of the objects differ per response, obviously. So what we created is an, a, a recursive function that, go, that takes the JSON as an input, loops through all the different like levels, and if it's an object, it is nested and nested and nested till it's not an object anymore, it's in raw value, then we discard all the keys from the JSON, just got the values, and put these values in kind of inflated dictionary so the user can search for values. And I saw that we had this piece of code constantly sharing over five or six different projects. Okay, now you can say, fine, just make an NPM module out of it and host it internally, but then we had folks saying, fine, we have applications that do server-side rendering, um, and we would like to provide this little piece of, of software in an old PHP application or WordPress plugin as well. Um, and we don't want to use NPM install for any kind of WordPress stuff. We just copy the JavaScript and that's it. That's not helpful because that, that means if you, we have a blacklist of keys hard-coded in this um, search thing that say, okay, if the key's this or that, don't allow or don't put this value in the flat dictionary. And then I have joined the team as an engineering lead five months ago or four months ago and said, why are you not just using WebAssembly for that? Just write this, take, the, take the, the whole data in, flatten the structure, build it in the, basically in WebAssembly and just return the flat dictionary. So you can loop in JavaScript and just call the WebAssembly function, get the flat dictionary back, put it back in an array and use, in, use this piece of functionality in whatever language or in whatever um, application you want. And that works pretty simple and smooth because it's still written in TypeScript, this whole implementation as it was before, but now it's a WebAssembly module and it's so simple to deploy it because we just modify it, deploy it once, and then we download the, the WebAssembly binary from a resource via HTTP in the browser. And it works in all our products, in, in the WordPress implementation that is freaking old in the Vue.js new applications in React. It's, it's just what it was meant to be in WebAssembly. It's a single binary that's distributed on a web server. It's pretty small. It's downloaded very fast on, on page load and it just does what it, it, it should do. It flattens down the object tree and gives you back and, and flat dictionary so you can search. Does it make sense? As I said, maybe not so excited as you may think of. It's not, it's not like I don't know, the core of cancer, but it's, it's a WebAssembly binary that solves a real problem in the browser. One theory that I could also throw out is the, uh, the proximity to KubeCon. So cross-pollination of attendees, is, I suspect there's probably not a lot of browser vendors at KubeCon. Maybe there are. I don't want to speak for anyone, but that could be another, another, another factor in sort of attendance lists. But you know, obviously I can't speak to everyone else per se. Ah. Hey, I'm just curious um, your opinion. If you've heard of eGUI, it's a front-end uh, Rust package, and I'm just wondering if you've heard of it, if you can comment on it. I have heard of it in the sense of I've seen it on the Rust subreddit, but that is the extent of my knowledge. Does anyone else? Oh, do you know about eGUI? No, I have a question. Oh, okay, wait. Does anyone know about eGUI and want to talk about that? There we go. Oh, sorry, I'm making you run around. All right, you're, you're on deck. Let's hear about eGUI. Thanks. Um, so maybe for introduction, um, I'm Tom from Google. Um, I work in the Chrome team, and um, I did look at eGUI as one of the examples of uh, cameras rendered application frameworks. And um, to sighted users, it looks and works great. Um, the challenges are with the things we take for granted on the browser that don't work anymore once you have these solutions. So think of um, the built-in browser translate feature, for example. Because it's all rendered in a canvas, there's no information whatsoever anymore. So um, if you depend on translating, this doesn't work. If you have extensions that uh, modify the DOM trim in any form, and the simplest is obviously um, blocking ads, this doesn't work anymore. Um, 
More, uh, more importantly, maybe even um, any kind of accessibility um, assistive tools that people require um, on, like um, screen readers, they require you to somehow have this information that is conveyed to sighted users in um, the canvas in a way that um, this assistive technology can make use of it. Um, we at Google um, developed Flutter, which is another canvas rendered application framework. And um, I dig, 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 duck, duck. I dug into um, its uh, access, uh, accessibility support and they essentially create a secondary DOM tree that is purely created for assistive technology to make sense of. And um, eGUI doesn't really do that yet. So if you look at um, in Chrome DevTools, there's this um, assist, uh, accessibility tree feature that you can activate. And you, can, you look at this to a sighted user, entirely rich demo application that has a billion form fields and select boxes and radio boxes and like all the um, graphic use interface um, things that we are used to. Um, to the accessibility tree, there is nothing at all exposed. So it is something that you may want to use, but be aware of um, the challenges that this solution com comes with. And um, there's not picking on ego specifically. Um, I looked at a bunch of frameworks and they all have the same trouble. They work well for sighted users and people talk about like, hey, this is amazing 60 FPS and stuff. And um, it is performing everything. But then the moment you start looking at it from like non-sighted users uh, point of views, or even just, as I said, uh, browser extensions, um, built-in browser features, um, something as simple as find on page. So all those things just don't work anymore. Um, we see it in, in Google Docs, for example. So in Google Docs, this uses Canvas for rendering. Um, if you use the browser native find in page, you won't, won't find any word on that page. If you use the built-in find feature, it will work again because they have made it work. But like, be aware of those lim limitations, I think. I think we have a quick follow-up to the eGUI stuff, and then we're going to go over to you. Hey, yeah. Uh, so just to add it also, uh, for Kotlin, we also have this kind of framework composed multi-platform. Yep, and we face with the same problem. Uh, what we discussed with which W3C guys, that there was like uh, an approach or group that working on accessibility object model. So you can like mark your Canvas application with, with accessibility tags and it could help like browser to implement all of these features like search, et cetera, et cetera. I know there is like a limited uh, version of it inside Chrome uh, browser like for text, but not for images or something like that. So maybe it could help like the, this part of specification or new specification for it. Okay, um, yeah, so the accessibility object model, AOM for short, um, is something that was nice in theory. The problem is um, on the web, we can't have nice things. So imagine you are an insurance company and you have this tariff and um, you notice, oh, someone is using um, assistive technology to access that web page, which most likely means they're blind. And um, this means, for example, or uh, less cited than like what is regular. And this means that um, we've seen companies abuse this feature and um, also the um, people who use and depend um, assistive technology. For them, the web is one of the um, like few pl places where they just can walk around and be themselves without immediately shouting at everyone, hey, um, I'm short-sighted or I'm blind or whatever. So the thing is the AOM, um, the old version that was developed, was detectable by sites and sites abuse this uh, for like, as I said before, any kind of tracking or just even in the worst case, disabling certain um, website features in the sense of, uh, oh, we, we won't give you a contract or your contract will be 20% more expensive than a regular sighted users one. So it's trackable and um, that's why it's not a practical solution in many cases. Um, but yeah, like the theory behind it was nice and well-intentioned. So they're rowing back now and looking at what, what can we do instead. Um, the Flutter approach um, that I mentioned before, um, they just use regular web um, components. Sorry, I'm trying to move around. Uh, web, uh, like custom elements and web components. 
um, that take ARIA roles. So if there's a button that is painted on the canvas, um, they have this custom element that has an ARIA role of button and so on, so they can convey this information. It is still technically detectable by um, the page, so it's also not a like super nice feature, but it's mostly detectable because Flutter make it opt-in because, as you can imagine, having this parallel DOM tree for complex applications can be expensive. So Flutter by now, um, like the default as it is now by, by default, they don't activate the accessibility features. Um, so if you have to manually opt in, then the site of course can detect it. So it's a super complex uh, space and like always on the web, we need to think of how can someone possibly abuse this? And um, in many cases, the answer is, oh, very easily. And um, you just need to think of like, if ever evil, how could I abuse this um, if, if I had access to this information? And that's exactly what happened. So um, any kind of, oh, that's nice in theory approach, um, in practice oftentimes breaks down. And um, I agree it sucks, but yeah, it is what it is. Thank you so much. All right, I think we're gonna move on over here. All right. You're next. Yeah, I have a question about application, uh, like backend APIs, uh, Kafka Streams application I have written in Java and Quarkus. Specifically, will Wasm, these components, functions, whatever the correct term is, will that replace, say, deploying those traditional backend APIs and whatever in Docker containers? Or would say like the Python lambdas my team has in AWS would instead of pushing up a zip or Docker image, would I push up a you know Wasm component? The answer is that Wasm will replace everything. Wasm is going to be the entire no no. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, this is probably something that I'm not I'm not I don't, I'm not necessarily personally super knowledgeable about. I know the intention is that a component is sort of your application. It sort of is a self-describing everything packaged up in that component. We have, there's been a lot of talks of mirroring uh, components inside of like OCI artifacts and things like that as well. So the intention is to very much kind of fit into that workflow, not necessarily supplant all of it and replace all of it kind of immediately at, at day one, but that's, that's sort of the idea is that the component is sort of your entire application all built in. Now, again, that all it depends a lot on the exact like environment you're deploying to, the exact service, the exact APIs and all that, but that's probably the best extent that I can answer that. Sounds good. Oh. I have a question. Uh, oh, wait, wait, hang on, sorry. Uh, you're next then, I think we have you next. Okay, you yeah, that? thank you. Uh, so I, I just want to resonate uh, one of the previous questions about was um, in the edge environment uh, embedded. I also remember you were saying, you know, um, maybe, you know, uh, some other people will be kind of more into the edge, you were not there. Uh, but then I realized, hey, I can throw the question to the audience <laughs> to see any one in this room that uh, want to speak up a little bit about your opinion about the was um, in embedded, you know, environment. Um, like, what is your experience there? What do you? How do you see the was um, applications was um, uh, to be deployed on the uh, embedded environment? If you can, if if deeper, uh, we can go to kind of real time uh, operating system and real time applications. That would be even better. I got two here, but let's do. I think Keith in the back. Uh, thank you. I'm Keith Winstein. As Alex said earlier, there will be a talk on this at about 3 p.m. today, and I, I've heard it's going to be great. Um, I, 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 I think, you know, there's the WASM side of that and there's the embedded side of that. I think, you know, if you are looking to isolate possibly harmful or untrusted or misbehaving code in a very, very lightweight way, WASM can do that it can transpile the code to a machine code representation that has all the safety guarantees of WebAssembly, the type checking of call indirects, the out of bounds checking of the memory, and it can do that in you know, single digit kilobytes. Um, so I think it is competitive for that situation. Follow up, follow up for this? All right, we got one more review. Yep. 
I just want to share a really interesting use case for Wasmin Embedded. I recently met a guy from the Netherlands and uh, his company doing like handheld gaming console and games written in Wasm. Uh, and the idea is to make it collaborative because a Wasm binary itself, it's like a pure function. You know, you can just load state, uh, hold the state of the game outside of Wasm binary and uh, like programmers who working on game sh should not think about like synchronization states in between players. So because the state is outside of the Wasm binary. So yeah, as far as I remember, they're using uh, Wasm I, Wasmi uh, runtime. Yep, and th there's like a use case for them. Any other follow-ups on the embedded aspects? All right, I'll do this then. If you're interested in embedding, raise your hand, and then everyone look around and see who's raising their hand. I'm gonna, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna necessarily necessarily organize this myself, but that's embedded folks, and I think we'll move on to the next question now. So thank you, you're up. Yep, uh, I have learned somewhere that Wasm helps run machine learning models on the browsers. So do you have any inputs or thoughts, like how does model run in a browser, how can we? run the machine learning models, or how can we ship the models to the browsers? I will again plaster this with a big warning. This is not my area of expertise. I can talk about a very high level. I'm probably wrong, so definitely verify with my actual experts on this. What I am aware of is that um, WASM is not necessarily the best place to be running these computations like learning or whatever themselves. Primarily in the sense of that often runs on a GPU or in a CPU with a lot of vectorized instructions, a lot of the GPU parallelism. WASM does, does not necessarily have that at this time. It's a little, it's possible to run threads in the browser, but it's not exactly the easiest thing to do just yet. It's possible to have SIMD in the browser, but that's only limited to 128 bits. So it's probably a little bit slower than what your native CPU probably has access to. So in those senses, running the like major computational aspects, WASM is not quite there yet. It doesn't have full SIMD. It doesn't have like a super buttery smooth uh, threading story in the web browser. And it doesn't have full access to the GPU yet. You'd have to manually go through web GPU to kind of do all that aspect. Um, the other aspect of models is, at least personally, I'm not aware, I, at least I'm aware, from what I've seen, models tend to be quite large, and I think if you want to try and ship that entire model to users, I'm not sure there's necessarily an optimized way to do that. I don't think WASM necessarily replaces that. You could have it running on the server, for example, where WASM is, has all that data on the server and it can read that all in. But one of the issues you might run into with that is that uh, most WASM toolchains and languages today are based on the 32-bit version of WASM, and many models are larger than four gigabytes. So if you wanted to actually load that into WASM, you just can't, because you just literally cannot fit it in the address space. So this is where the 64-bit version of WASM, which is uh, very recently now progressing through the stabilization phases, will become stable relatively soon. You would have to use that, but the tool chains are not necessarily kind of uh, all lined up just yet. You, you, you can certainly get, the, get it working, but you won't find the same level of support as you'll find for WASM32. It'll, it'll, it'll get there. It'll just take some time. All right. Oh, my God. So, okay. I'm going to do you raised this question. So I'm going to do, oh, God. Wait. One, two, three, four, five, six. We got one here. One here. One there. Yes. Okay. Well, you've got it. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just answering the question about... Oh, wait, sorry. There are, are you got a microphone back there. You're number, you're number two now. Sorry, I'm remembering. Okay, I'm sorry. You're number two. You're number one. Awesome. I've seen some of the PRs and discussions around the... I think it's like... It doesn't have a formal name yet. The WASI T2 target. The WASI P2 module target. Uh, for As someone who like works on an interpreter in C, it seems like an easier thing to target to figure out how to wrap my head around the name mangling for, for targeting the component model. It also seems potentially easier to consume as a host. I'm wondering, is it going to be compatible? Do we see it as something that can be always maintained along with the component representation? Will it be long lived? And is there something I'm missing? Why, why not just have that one? Excellent questions. And so and uh, I, I can answer the two questions of maintainability and wait, why not have why not only have that? All right. From the maintain from the maintainability perspective, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, components are wrappers around modules, and so components are not their own binary format or anything like that. And so components are always going to be using, for example, the native LLVM support to emit a core WASM module. 
So LLVM is not going to learn how to emit an actual component anytime soon. And so we've got CoreWise modules coming out. They've got to do something. And then we somehow have to transform that into a component. And so what you're looking at is effectively the T2 target, or sort of name pending. We still have to figure out the actual name for all this. But the answer is yes. That, that is, this is intended to be maintainable into the future. This is intended. Well, we will have uh, formally in the component model repository definitions of sort of this is the name mangling expected. This is the semantics involved here. Because it's not quite as simple as just hooking up names. There's a little bit of stuff around kind of like these situations need to track when you're actually inside of a component, or these situations may not quite work depending on this component. Some various options and things like that. But anyway, the general idea is yes, we'll definitely be maintained over time. Now, why? Why would we not just have core WASM? And so this is actually, uh, Luke actually gave a great talk last year at WASMCon, and it was specifically sort of about a lot of uh, problems that components are, are designed to solve. And so there's certainly a class of problems where you don't necessarily need a, the entire component story. You can just kind of have that module and run directly with that module. There are a lot of problems, however, where you do want components. And one of the major natures of that is the composability. So being able to take two components off the shelf and run them together, you can actually do that because they're in separate address spaces. They have defined APIs between them. Whereas with CoreWASM modules, loading CoreWASM modules together, you often conflict in terms of linear memory if you're doing shared memory. And then if you're doing kind of a higher level, there are separate address spaces, that's sort of effectively a component at that point. So not necessarily a slam dunk answer as to why not, why not just have core modules. I think one of the reasons is just sort of a lot of the evolution going on here. But I think that um, the composability aspect and sort of the kind of kernel of self-contained functionality of a component is going to be sort of, that's predicted at least to be one of the major aspects of having a component. So in that sense, uh, I, at least from my perspective, they're both very well motivated in terms of one's not going to trump the other and then like make it, make it useless at that point. question being around safety difference of the module representation. And this is one where um, sort of yes, kind of depending on how you're viewing it. So core WASM, for example, is always for the component model going to export its linear memory. That's just saying, here's my entire address space. You get unfettered access to it. You can do whatever you want. In some sense, that's a little inherently insecure in the sense of I don't actually want you to do that. I'm actually giving you a pointer and a length, and I kind of only want you to read that pointer and the length. So from a core module perspective, from that sort of layer abstraction boundary, there's no guardrails. There's, you have full access to everything internally. Perfect for some use cases, not great for other use cases. Components, however, you literally cannot export a linear, a linear memory through a component. A component is a shared nothing boundary which prevents all that happening. And so when I say that I'm giving you a pointer to length, that's actually all you get. You only get the pointer to length. And so that's sort of like, uh, in, in that sense, it, it is a different uh, paradigm in terms of security and whatnot. So for example, if you wanted to deploy a component into a, into a distributed application which has multiple components and like this one has your private keys, you have a very, very strong guarantee it's never gonna leave that private key unless you have a function that just returns it, which you probably ought to saying it doesn't. And so in that sense, uh, you have a very strict, like just structural guarantee that your private keys are stuck there. Whereas if you had modules in this whole system, you would have to prove that every module doesn't read the memory of that module, things like that. All right, number two. Uh, yeah, there's a question about running ML models in the browser. Uh, there's a talk tomorrow uh, at 11 by Thomas Lively from Google where he's gonna talk about some of the features of Google Meet, like background detection and replacement, echo detection, et cetera that are using WebAssembly modules to run these ML models using WASM SIMD. Uh, there's been a lot of low-level optimization work that's gone into that. Um, there's also a question earlier about WebAssembly applications. He's gonna talk about some of those as well, like this note-taking app I'm using right now uh, that I wrote that's C++ compiled to WebAssembly. All right. W uh, what's your name? Uh, oh, my name's Billy, and I'm from Google. All right, if you're interested in talking about applications and, and uh, ML models, there you go. All right, I think we were, yes. I'm curious about the, your, your opinions about the JavaScript ecosystem. Like what, what is the future of um, like TypeScript compilation directly to WebAssembly? I understand there's, you can embed JavaScript engines in WebAssembly, but is there a growing interest in directly compiling TypeScript? It, it, this is definitely an interesting question. So this is one where I think from the browser perspective, probably almost certainly not. This is where JavaScript compiled to WASM running in a browser is going to be way slower than actually running JavaScript in the browser. However, as we've been seeing this, this outer browser use case where people just want to run JavaScript because they're very used to running JavaScript, very, very interesting, interesting there. Um, in that sense, 
I, I do think there's a lot of interest in sort of skipping some build steps, kind of making it a little bit easier, but it's all primarily uh, motivated around uh, performance guarantees or sort of what's the constraints of the system you're running. So the current, uh, a lot of the JavaScript runtimes right now, they're sort of picking a JavaScript runtime, compiling it to WASM, and then throwing your source code and running all that in WASM. So that has various tra downsides and trade-offs to that. So for example, QuickJS is super small, but not exactly the fastest thing in the world. SpiderMonkey is a little bit larger, but is a bit faster, and, but then also has interesting aspects of like the GC, for example, and kind of how that interacts with WebAssembly. And so, like for example, if you, another aspect of SpiderMonkey is that it might take a while for you to compile the entire SpiderMonkey.wasm locally, so you get, it's not that kind of quick edit debug cycle is a little bit slower if you have to compile all of SpiderMonkey every single time. So I think that a lot of those sort of pressures of how we're gonna solve those issues or how those end up uh, kind of getting solved one way or another is gonna shape the trajectory here. So the promise of compiling TypeScript to WebAssembly sounds great. This is the whole assembly script idea of like you, we can have a subset of TypeScript or kind of a, a, a very large portion of language which goes directly to WebAssembly. You have great performance, you don't have any of these type checks. But I think uh, assembly script is very much a subset of TypeScript, or I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I'm not an expert on assembly script either. So don't, don't take my, 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 my knowledge as like the actual kind of word of God or anything like that. But in any case, um, uh, what was I saying? Right, uh, the performance of JavaScript is gonna be a really interesting one where so we get these kind of highly optimized engines such as SpiderMonkey compiled to, compile to WASM and the performance of that relative to compiling all of JavaScript to WebAssembly is a bit of a question. And I think it's also still an open question of is it even possible to compile all of uh, WebAssembly to types, sorry, all of TypeScript to WebAssembly in a way that doesn't just bring a giant JavaScript runtime and interpreter and things like that. So I think there's a lot of open questions here. There's a lot of space to explore. Uh, again, I'm not the expert on this area, so I, but I, I think that we'll see a lot more development kind of over the, over the next few years. There's, I don't think it's certain one way or the other that this is the solution or this is not the solution or, or something like that. Sorry, it's not a very conclusive answer, but that's sort of the best I got. Do you have a follow-up to that? Yeah. All right. It's all the way. So th there is a, an engine that compiles JavaScript to WebAssembly directly. It's called POR4, P-O-R, F-F-O-R. Um, you can look into that if you want to learn more about that, that effort. It's, it's fairly promising. It's pretty far along, but it's not like production at, at all. Yeah, they definitely exist. I think there's another one that just came out recently as well. Uh, and so if, if you search around, you'll definitely find a couple that, have, that are, are definitely tackling this problem, and I think they're going to be exploring the space for sure. All right, thank you for next. Hi, this is a question regarding determinism and performance. <laughs> ah, yes. Yes. So um, we've seen a, a remarkable number of discussions recently in the standard itself around uh, the trade-off between, think for example, the relaxed SIMD proposal and things of that nature, and also some discussions around uh, partially out-of-bound stores, which have been taxing <laughs> everybody in a few places. Where do you see, personal opinion again here, um, the direction of, say, for example, the profiles proposal, where you're starting to introduce formal forms of non-determinism, if that makes any sense, right. or absolute cold, hard determinism in this space. Do you f feel that there's like space in that, or is that actually starting to fragment the ecosystem heavily? Mm. Yes, my, my dis disclaimer of personal opinions and all that. So. Uh, Personally, if you want to talk about fragmentation, I would say the fragmentation is already there. We already have users who are interested in determinism. We have user, users who are interested in performance on this certain platform, which are not that curious about determinism in that, in that aspect. So in my mind, and again, I'm, I would love to, or I, I'm happy to be proven wrong here. I would love to actually see profiles become a thing. I think that's a great way to formalize this and to kind of have a shared understanding in the WASM ecosystem. If you want determinism, this is where we go. If you want performance, this is where we go. And I think sort of one of the high level ideas is sort of if you imagine WASM sort of guiding uh, chip vendors themselves, we could for example say that we have a very strong contingent of users who require absolute determinism, but they don't run well on Intel for whatever reason. I'm not just, as just a random example, not, not, not picking on Intel here by any means. But so uh, you can imagine though that there, for example, are some instructions and for, we, we could say that there are future instructions in Intel to, to make specifically that fast. So that's obviously like kind of a 10, 20 year horizon as to whether that would actually be even possible. But personally, I do think there's a lot of value in proposals and I think there's a lot of value in making that standard and, and saying, if you want these particular aspects, kind of reducing fragmentation into a sort of standard set of subsets. Whether that actually succeeds, I think that's a big open question for sure. 
please do. Do you see that? Oh, thank you very much. So do you see that dovetailing in with the your previous statement with regards sort of the extensions to the, uh, the core ISA? So if they go hand in hand, would that work? Would, they, would you consider them orthogonal or are they actually part of the same story? Personally, I think they're part of the same story. And again, these are all personal opinions. You'll find many, many different opinions on this. But I, I do think, I think it would be great to have certain extensions in various profiles. So for example, if you're running on a tiny bit of device and you want the, the minimal size, you probably don't want all of SIMD. You probably don't want all of the garbage collection proposal. So having a standard profile for if uh, like deterministic behavior or a standard profile for SIMD for kind of a small runtime behavior. Now, this is obviously a huge thing. Like this is a very amorphous idea. I know profiles were a huge thing in Rust, and they never had—they have not actually gotten over the hump in terms of becoming a standard thing at this point. So I have plenty of experience to say that this is huge, and it takes a lot of effort, and it hasn't actually borne fruit in the past from what I've seen. So whether it actually all pans out, a little unclear. But the idea of it to me is at least promising. <laughs> like just to say, humorously, hi, I'm from Arm. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to chat more. All right. Thank you. You're up next. You're up next. Yep. What, what's the current state of porting uh, scripting languages, like more, maybe more niche languages, to to Wasm? For example, I know there's like JavaScript and Python and work on bigger ones, but I'd be interested in like maybe porting Smalltalk or a, you know a modern implementation like Varo. As far as I'm, I can talk at a high level. I don't know anything about small, small talk myself, but at the high level, it's sort of the idea of you compile the entire interpreter to, well, I guess you have two options. You have the option of sort of compiling directly from the language to WASM. This is sort of if you can map your language's semantics directly to WASM, that tends to be kind of difficult. And so a lot of times you take your interpreter, you compile that to WASM, and then you bundle that together. One of the, one of the major things there, at least in the outer browser space, is the idea of this sort of wizening. So there's a, this is a tool which uh, is in the Bytecode Alliance, which will take a WASM module, run a function, and then emit a WASM module with that function already run. This is typically, for an example, in a dynamic language, your startup routine. It'll parse the source code. It'll parse various, it'll set up various runtime data structures. So at least from my perspective, that's sort of the high level. But the, the base thing from what we've seen in a lot of places is compiling the interpreter, compiling the initial runtime to WebAssembly is sort of one of the initial big hurdles to go across. And that sort of depends on how featureful the language is. So for example, if MMAP is a fundamental primitive of your language, it's going to be kind of difficult to map that to WASM because WASM doesn't have MMAP. But do you have like a more specific question, or is that kind of? Uh, well, how would like WASI come into play? Like, how would you be able to you know work with the outside world? If that makes sense. Good, good, very excellent question. So this is where there's sort of uh, two branches I think you can take. One is that you want to run on the web. So in that case, the web has an entire platform associated with it. It has this entire suite of APIs for you to use, and it's entirely up to you how you access it. It typically requires some amount of JavaScript glue to call console.log, for example, and like decode a string from core WASM memory. But that's sort of, uh, there. As from what I've seen, there is not necessarily a standard, or I have not seen a standard in that sense where many languages have like one standard for all accessing DOM APIs. So that's on the browser. Outside of a browser, uh, there's this is the whole WASI idea, which is sort of this is these are the standard system utilities you have available to you. So if you want to print to the screen, there's a suite of APIs where you call and you can print to the screen. That's sort of print and things like that. Um, WASI has a whole suite of stuff for like environment variables. It's kind of intended for kind of, it's inspired by a lot of like CLI, like uh, Unix, you've got pipes, you've got uh, files and all, all that good stuff. So the intention is that uh, if you call out to the host, if you need some sort of like libc functionality in your language, uh, that's typically bottoms out inside of a WASI function calling on the host, which then figures out what to do. And then you can still run WASI things on the web, but it, it's, it's sort of like if you want to target one or two primarily. But that's, that's the goal of WASI is pro providing a standard set of APIs, which any language can get access to. It's not precisely Windows or Unix or the web. It's sort of an amalgamation of those. Finally, um, well, what's like the story for uh, just-in-time compilation? for any like interpreter language that may use that? That is a bit of a, I, as far as I know, it's not a super well explored space. There have been demos of compiling, of, of doing this from JIT compilation. They're primarily in the web browser nowadays, and it all can work. The idea is that you sort of admit a WASM module, and then you let the browser compile that WASM module, and you sort of deal with all the fiddly details of putting that in tables, getting all that lined up, having various trampolines and things like that and doing all that. So WASM does not have native JIT compilation. You cannot natively in WASM just say, I would like to compile these bytes and get native machine code, things like that. But it is possible to build that on the web. This is one where uh, WASI is not able to do that yet. So there are no APIs for dynamically loading, loading code in WASI yet. But we've done have various talks about sort of getting towards that at some point, but it's not, 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 not quite there. So if you're interested in JIT, you'll definitely want to go on the, on the browser. 
There's an excellent blog post, I think, by Andy Wingo about doing this uh, for JavaScript, or maybe it was, no, it's a different language. Sorry, I, I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Search for Andy Wingo JIT browser, and I'm sure you'll find that. And that's sort of the, the state of the art of what I've, what I've seen there. Thanks. All right. Thank you for being patient. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess as a question, so when uh, a new type of like instruction feature gets introduced to WASI or WASM, it takes like proposals, reviews, and uh, it's important for the community like to know how soon those features like get through. So for example, we at Amazon like uh, tried to introduce some things. For example, one of the proposals we did was on threads and they didn't get to the preview too. And uh, so the question is how, from your perspective, it looks like uh, how long does it take usually like to get a proposal and how, what the share of the proposals gets through and what share gets rejected? Yeah. In my mind, this is a very broad question and it is highly dependent on the specifics of the proposal, the people involved, the companies, the motivations and everything involved there. So threads, for example, Threads is massive. It is a massively fundamental piece of the system, and that's one of the main reasons it didn't go from P1 to P2 is it just, it could not fit. It, if we had tried to get threads in P2, we still wouldn't have P2 today. We still would be trying to design it, and probably half of us wouldn't actually be here. So, but, but for example, there are other proposals, such as uh, I have a proposal for CoreWASM, which is just adding a couple, couple of instructions. I suspect that won't take years to, years to do. It'll be relatively easy as long as folks agree with it. So in that, in that sense, it really, really depends on the proposal. And I, I don't think that you can safely say there's sort of an average time per proposal. I mean, you can calculate it, but I think depending on the proposal itself is kind of what, what really happens. And so that really, I, and from what I've seen, if a proposal is sort of extending the existing system in a way the system is already built, such as just simply adding new instructions, it tends to go much, much faster. It's way easier to work, to reason about that proposal, to implement that proposal, put it inside of engines, things like that. If you're adding a fundamentally new capability, such as a 64-bit linear memory or a, a threads proposal, which is like actually adding multi-threading with new instructions and semantics and everything like that, that is a, where it gets much, much more difficult because the implementation side is much more difficult, uh, both on the tool chain and the engine side. The uh, spec side is much more difficult because it's all brand new formalization that has, has to come in. The discussion side is much more difficult because it's so much more broad. You have to make all these decisions for WASM. So in that sense, I, like at least in my head, I can I, I classify proposals in those two categories of like big new things or like small extensions to existing things. Those take many, many years. These take a small number of years. Uh, yeah, just small follow up. So uh, I mean, to understand how big is a proposal, I'm like reading it through, and uh, I'm kind of guessing like how big it is. But like, do you like? I mean, probably you just like understand that, but how like users like who expect features uh, should try to estimate the size of the proposal, yeah. Basically, if it's major or like minor one. Are you thinking specifically threads or just any proposal in general? I mean, for like, let's say, like, I mean, let's, let's say in general, yeah. Like. I think, at least in my mind, it's gonna be very, very difficult for an outsider to make that evaluation accurately. It's just, it's, it's one where unless you have the whole system or lots of the system in your head, it's very difficult to understand like, oh, this is fundamentally new or oh, this is just a small extension. So in that sense, what I would recommend is uh, find someone who does have that knowledge and run it by them. Gotcha, yeah, I think I'll be asking questions on Zulip. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. I think, Till, do you want to follow up? Um, yeah, there, uh, one additional factor in all of this is, um, uh, it, Tom asked earlier about where are all the browser um, people here. And I think the context there is WasmCon was started as a conference by people coming kind of from the cloud native space. And so that's that, that can be seen in the program and the attendees. Um, and it shows that in a way there are, what we are trying to do is we are trying to build a meta ecosystem with WebAssembly and in particular even more with the component model where you can target a unified platform from lots of different languages and then that platform can be implemented in lots of on lots of different sort of more native platforms we have more native is a bit weird because the browser is one of them um, and those all those real kind of not meta but more concrete ecosystems all have their own 
histories, their own constraints, their own requirements. And in a lot of cases, what you're running into is that you come into something with a proposal and you want it for your specific ecosystem, your specific use cases, your specific platform. But to have it actually get in, you need enough uptake, enough interest and viability across multiple other ecosystems in which you yourself have no immediate interest in. Um, and the most concrete thing where a lot of issues coming from the non-web space um, run into is that there is a requirement for all core WebAssembly features to be um, to, to become part of the standard. They need to have two um, browser engine implementations. Um, there has been a lot of talk about should that be lifted. Um, I also work at Fermion. I, I used to, same as Alex, used to work at Mozilla, used to work on SpiderMonkey, um, but I'm not one of the browser people anymore. I still think this is a really good requirement because the web is sort of the ultimate gatekeeper as a platform. Either you get to deploy to the web and thus to kind of everything or you don't. Um, and so support on the web is really important, but it does mean for a proposal to actually make it anywhere close to being part of the standard, you need to convince browser people to do a whole bunch of work. And that means something needs to be in it for them. It's not just a, hey, we would really like this uh, uh, for, for our use case. How about you do a whole bunch of work? Um, so that that's the really the hardest thing and Threads is, as you certainly know, one of the issues where the requirements or constraints of the web platform are very, very different from those for everything else and make it extremely hard to find a compromise that is viable for everybody, even though in this case everybody wants threads. We all, threads turn out kind of, kind of useful. Um, and we, we, we all want them. It's really, really hard to get to something where even people are willing to do the work we we find a design that works. And then there are all these cases where people on the web don't say, yeah, I can see how you need that, but I don't, and my team isn't growing anytime soon because it's not AI related. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. All right, oh, follow up? Yeah. Right. Just follow up question. Is there any requirement right now for moving in phases for a proposal uh, to have at least one implementation outside of browser? No, no not, not a formal one. Um, it is more and more kind of conventional that people are seeing what does it look like for the outside of the browser folks. Um, and that is a conversation um, that um, uh, I think makes a ton of sense to have, not to weaken the requirement on the browser side, but to introduce other um, requirements and to be a bit more flexible. On the WASI side, for example, what we are doing is um, we don't have fixed requirements for all proposals. Instead, part of the criteria for entering phase two in the process is that the group gets to vote on the criteria for entering phase four, I think, and gets to set, okay, we need to have at, this, at least this many different implementations. It needs to have at, this, at least this much proof of viability on the tool chain side. And I think that kind of more dynamic, flexible approach would make sense where the standardization body can per proposal decide what kind of evidence for viability do we need to see before finalizing this? So a quick time check, we've got 10 minutes left. I'm holding you all hostage from lunch, so I'm gonna use this 10 minutes as much as possible, but if anyone has some final questions, we've got maybe one or two more questions. Just a very quick seconding of the, the requirement for gatekeeping for adoption into standards. Um, in a from a very practical point of view, quite often the enablement work for new sections of the standard doesn't fall on necessarily the community. It falls on the companies underlying it who are <laughs> wanted to be performant on their particular platform. And that creates 
enormous resourcing headaches when you have um, rapidly progressing standards. It, it's a difficult thing to manage and therefore actually having that gate is extremely valuable in places because it demonstrates immediate commercial value. All right. You, no, you, you've talked too much. Any, one more question. I, I work with Tills, but uh, any, any other final questions? All right, one more Till. They, they, there is a solution to this. It is called, well, Andy Wingo, um, but now it, more, more generally, Egalia, and even more generally, consultancies. So wh whoever here might be in a position where they say, I really would like to have something in the standard, but it requires implementations across multiple different places that I have no expertise in, but I actually have budget. You can throw it at external consultants who have the expertise and can implement these things in other engines. That is a kind of time-tested way to get things into web standards. It works very well, and I think it's actually a pretty good way for to, to, to drive things forward. Um, because it addresses to some degree this resourcing issue. All right, final, final call for any final, final questions. I'll obviously be around today and tomorrow as well, ask more questions to me, but going once, going twice. All right, uh, before I leave you all, go, let you all go, there are 618 opcodes. What's number zero? I'm kidding, go have lunch. <laughs> Thank you for coming.